Tonight's topic is very dear to our heart because um, we are actually a part of other things, also teaching, and we're teaching a class about professional, uh, uh, pro professional practice. How do you actually make a living once you leave school? And um, uh, tonight's topic about new business models in photography is definitely hitting a very important core and point in our scenario today. I'm very excited about the speakers tonight. You'll get more of a bio from uh, our moderator, Fabrice Najari. And um, uh, I'm very happy to welcome Sarah Walker of Shutterstock, Noor Electra El Shami from Art I Curate, and Kenneth Schlenker from uh, Gertrude and Artlist, two platforms that he that he founded. So without further ado, I uh, let you listen and learn, and um, thank you very much. I'm going to give a very, very quick int introduction of, of tonight's topic before uh, letting the, the, the microphone to, to Sarah that I'm also going to introduce. Um, but tonight's topic is the new business models of photography. Very vast, wide subject. Um, that we're going to try to really dive in um, and give certain perspective with three amazing creative entrepreneurs uh, that are with us tonight. Really, the context of, of this discussion is, is emerging um, because in the last decade, we, we really saw an, a tremendous increase in terms of uh, digital imaging and, and, and wealth um, of, um, of visual content. And basically, this wealth of visual content has created and has deeply changed the balance uh, between photographer and its um, audience and buyers. Photo distribution is much easier than it used to do, it used to be, sorry. But at the same time for image maker, maintaining a position of never giving your work for free has become more and more difficult. If you want to sell work in the fine art world, it also is getting more and more complicated in a context of increased um, uh, competition and getting your work pre-financed is also obviously um, a very big problem when you're a fine art uh, artist. Um, so basically tonight we're going to tackle all these subjects from crowdfunding to the revolution of distribution to art licensing platform to the relationship between photographers and their clients. I put all these between brackets um, and we're going to hear really three different ways um, uh, for, for visual artists to make a living out of their trade. Um, so please uh, join me to welcome our first speaker, uh, Sarah Walker from, from Shutterstock. Hello everyone, my name is Sarah Walker. And as Fabrice mentioned, I work at Shutterstock, excuse me, um, I'll move the podium. Um, I lead our contributor growth efforts. So our contributors are photographers, illustrators, uh, filmmakers, and we recently added music into our collection as well. So I focus on our growth and how we scale that model at Shutterstock, and uh, we're gonna talk a little bit further about that. So tonight we're gonna cover a couple different topics. So I'll give you an overview of on Shutterstock, who we are and the marketplace, the two-sided marketplace that we've built uh, as a company. I'll also talk to you how um, as a contributor you can reach our customers globally, uh, how you might go about building a dynamic stock portfolio, ways in which Shutterstock uses content to uh, help educate our customers as well as our contributors, and then how you might go about submitting your content to Shutterstock. So who are we? We are a two-sided marketplace. So we have an infographic here that explains that we have both contributors, so photographers, filmmakers, illustrators, vector artists, musicians, as well as customers who range across big scale, um, high-end brands to uh, medium-sized businesses, to small businesses, to creative directors. Uh, we really run the gamut and we license, uh, the customers license the content from us. Our contributors, after uh, the content's been downloaded, they will earn a small royalty that's paid out to them. And then um, we can bring it full circle. So we always go back to the customers and we try and connect the dots between our contributors and our customers. So you'll see as we've grown, so we started out as Shutterstock, which is a, um, 
Uh, we license royalty-free images to our customers all over the world. We have one million customers worldwide, and as we grew the business, we started to see that there was demand for other niches. So we developed Big Stock, which is our value-driven brand, and it tends to focus on smaller businesses. From that, we saw that there's an opportunity to build Offset. Offset is really built around storytelling. So we have uh, assignment photographers, those who shoot for National Geographic and Martha Stewart and other, um, they'll shoot for magazine covers. Those who don't typically participate in the stock industry have submitted their content to us and it's being downloaded um, for big advertising campaigns. We have SkillFeed, which is a learning management platform. So it's a tutorial um, driven uh, two-sided marketplace where we could have an artist like yourself. You can teach and you can upload a video to SkillFeed and then you can teach an audience that's anywhere in the world about the craft that you know. WebDAM is a digital asset management system, so essentially it'll, it's a cloud-based system that allows you as an, a photographer to house your images and your archives of images in a cloud-based way. Uh, we recently acquired Rex, which is a premier editorial platform and then we have pre Premium Beat, which is royalty-free music. So it's interesting. Shutterstock, um, we're about 11 years old, 12 years old. We have had over 500 million downloads to date. So when you think about the scale, that's a lot. <laughs> Um, we're on average now selling four images every second. We have really cool screens around the office where you can see where the downloads are occurring around the world. It's a lot of fun to see because it's just so fascinating to see that happening in real time. We have over almost 80,000 artists. So we have photographers, again, filmmakers and artists, uh, illustrators all over the world from 100 different countries that we get to communicate with on a daily basis. It's really a lot of fun to see. And this is, these are examples of the work that you can find on Shutterstock. So to give you some sense of the depth and breadth of who we can reach, just to give you just an overview of um, the landscape of the internet today, because we are a digital company, a digital business, there are 2.9 billion internet users. They're online 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we'll see downloads coming through the site any time of the day. It's very, very interesting to see. Um, and you can, as a customer, you can have your need met, again, any time of the day. And we have contributors who are out shooting constantly. So on any given month, we're processing millions and millions of images. And our process today, we actually, we ha it's highly curated. So we have humans that actually touch the images and review them all around the world. We have over 200 reviewers, and they actually visually look at every single piece of content that comes through to us. We aren't using technology to do that. Um, so it's very interesting to see that we actually we care that much, and it's highly, that highly curated. So as an example of, as a photographer, if you're a contributor and how you can think about scaling your business and a new way to think about uh, earning money as a photographer, you can reach customers all over the world. You might reach a graphic designer who's in Singapore or a dentist in Australia, someone who works for a nonprofit in South America, a small business owner, an educator. We, like I said, we have customers all over the world doing all sorts of different things. And it's really interesting to see how they use that content to meet their need. So when you become a, a contributor, there are ways in which we help you, so we bridge that gap as a marketplace so you can reach customers. So we start to, when you join Shutterstock and you get approved, we work with you to help you understand what the customers want. So there's so many different needs that need to be met. We encourage you to shoot, because so many people are, are contributors are, uh, they've gone to uh, art school and they are professional photographers. We want your authentic content. So people ask us and say that seems very nebulous and very nondescript. We really want that, like we, we stay on trend as an example. So thinking about Instagram and having, um, uh, we, we see a lot of trends that come through and you'll see it in advertising campaigns that actually lend nicely into what we're seeing today outside in the real world. We want cultural diversity and local culture. So we get content from, as I said, 100, 150 different countries, and that's really important for us to make sure that we can meet various needs, whether it's local food shots or their family shots, um, landscape, et cetera, that content sells in Shutterstock. We want variation, and our customers always want, also and always want content that they can't find anywhere else. They come to us, we have one of the biggest collections, and that means a lot to them. So 
For those of you who are familiar with the stock industry, it's certainly evolved in the last 10 years over the last decade. It started out as being, I would, what we would say is being more drab and being very stereotypical like the handshake with the business professional. It's not that anymore. The images we'll show you tonight are beautiful. They're not the kind of images that many think of when they think of stock. So here's an example of one of the images from our collection. And it's going to explain to you why this is an image that sells in Shutterstock. So you'll see there's a limited color palette. It's calm and soothing. Looks like this woman could be on vacation. There's a lot of empty space. So you could have a text overlay. It could be in an advertising campaign, a magazine, etc. As I said, there's space for text. She looks relaxed, like she's on vacation or she's at the beach in her local hometown. And then it appears that there's been art direction and styling. So again, like you don't think that that's what you would get in stock, and this is a very beautiful representation of what you can find in Shutterstock. So when we start to think about what makes a perfect stock photo, you can argue it's so many different things, but this is another really interesting shot that came to us that we really like to uh, represent in our collection. Um, you'll see this, for this image in particular, it's unique. It's shot in black and white. It feels dramatic. Um, you'll notice too, I'll point out, there's no logo on his shoe. You have to ha make sure that um, there are trademark and copyright issues with stock that you can Photoshop out um, those slight nuances. But this ad, or this image, for example, could be used in an ad campaign, or it could be used in a magazine. Here's another example um, of an image from our collection. It's a woman. This could be used in so many different ways. It could be used for travel or leisure, lifestyle, landscape. Um, it feels like she does have, you can see her face, so you need to have a model release, and we'll talk about that in a little bit as well. Um, but again, this is a good representation of what we have in our collection. This is an image from Offset. So you'll see we like to use this image a lot. It's on our website um, and a lot of our marketing collateral. But it's fun because it's ice cream. And we're in summer. And you see um, we have focus. And then we have the background out of focus. So you're seeing a lot of different nuances that this artist took into consideration with this shot. Um, here's another great photo that we, um, we like as well. So this, for us, feels like it could be used in a travel um, magazine or a travel campaign. Uh, there's a lot of open space that could be used for text. It's easy to communicate. Here's a nature shot. Again, more text space that's open and available. So next we're going to talk about how to build a stock portfolio and what we look for. So we like to see, dyna um, we like to see dynamic content. And we like to have our artists create their own style. You'll see a lot of breadth and depth across the diversity of content that we do have within the Shutterstock network. When you think about what topics you should shoot, we have a lot of one-to-one -one communication. We use social media to communicate to our contributors what they should be shooting. Uh, we do email out topics. We have a contributor mobile app, actually, as well. So we do communicate that, that to our contributors. Uh, we also recently launched a trends report. So we will speak with our customers who are in the design industry, and we'll get their feedback, and we'll see how they're using the content. And we take that into consideration. And we try to make really data-driven uh, decisions and, and considerations when we share that information. Something to remember, too, there's a buyer for almost every subject. So depending on what your passion is, uh, there's content that's out there for anyone. So a lot, of our, a lot of times we'll hear that our contributors might be reticent to share some of their content. If it's beautifully shot, we want to see it. We want to see content that fits the need. If it's local content, especially anything that's authentic, we want to see it. There's probably someone who would uh, have a demand for that content. And we also see that broad concepts are very consistently popular. So again, it could, this looks like the, uh, the contributor was in Tuscany, potentially. So it's great content. We, also, we always have customers from around the world. This is a really fun uh, collection. Um, we have sports, food, and we have you know, emotion, love, potentially. So again, you can get really creative with the content that you're shooting and that you're sharing and uploading. 
As I mentioned, so we look for authenticity. So we use this dog in a lot of our communications because it looks like it was pulled from a mobile phone. So when we think about today, like there's a lot of citizen journalism going on. Everyone has a camera in their hand with their smartphone. So we do accept mobile photography. Um, it's, it has to be within the same guidelines that we have for the rest of our contributors. We have very high standards, um, but we want to see mobile content as well. Here you'll see some local content. Uh, so you can see there, again, there's lifestyle photography in here. We've got, um, we always have a lot of demand for um, uh, teenagers and children and families. So it's really great to see that we're getting some of the, this content uh, locally. This is super interesting. So I think Uli mentioned this about how war photography. So we actually have contributors who live um, in Ukraine and Russia. And when there was a lot of unrest, unrest a year or two years ago, we were getting a lot of editorial content coming to us. So it's great that we get this content real time and that we can push it back out to our customers. I mentioned the fact that um, with stock, you need a release. So for, so for those who aren't familiar, a release could be a property release or a model release. So anytime that you have uh, a person in your photography where the face or a feature is recognizable, you need to have a model release uh, with that. For property releases, that's for um, any building that might be in a National Historic Registry or a landmark, you have to make sure that you submit that as well because there are strict guidelines in terms of uh, copyright and trademark for how you can uh, sell those images. So I want to share with you a few ways. So, um, how Shutterstock is using our content. So we have this campaign uh, right now called Panorama. So it features 52 artists from 52 countries over 52 weeks. And this really came out of a, a need that we found through our data where we had customers who were asking specifically for content to be surfaced from local markets. So this is an example. If you go to Shutterstock.com slash Panorama, you'll see, uh, I think we're already up to week 21. Um, year to date. So we featured different artists every week across all of our brands. And you'll get a good sense of their collections as well as um, their stories. Because at the end of the day, I think we forget with stock that there's actually a human being take, shooting the content and then that person selling that content to another human being. So we're, that, we're using technology that is that platform to make the connection. So we also, um, we have a blog at Shutterstock. So this has been a really great educational tool for both our customers as well as our contributors. So we'll talk to um, experts within the industry, whether they're creative directors or they're photographers, et cetera, and um, we'll share insights, we'll do interviews. This is an example of something that we actually cut in-house. So this piece is actually about um, different styles of, um, we use Tarantino, Wes Anderson, and a few other directors, and then we use our stock footage to actually create um, a few clips to show you what it might look like if you used our footage. Um, and so we'll close with, if, for those of you tonight who would like to submit your content to Shutterstock, you can go to submit.shutterstock.com. You'll need 10 photos um, that are at least 4 megapixels. Uh, and if you have footage, which many photographers do these days, uh, the clips need to be, be between 5 and 60 seconds. Have a government-issued photo ID. Uh, you'll need metadata, so keyword and descriptions. Um, and you're good to go. Um, we, are a, uh, we are the only um, art crowd funding platform that lets um, artists raise funds uh, through the public in return for a commission on sale. Now, before I explain exactly like how that exactly works and um, um, go more in detail, I want to tell you why we actually started it and how it all began. So um, I co-founded Articulate with my longtime friend, um, Irina Turkin. Uh, while looking at the slide, I realize it's time for a new picture. <laughs> it's a little bit gone in the wind. Um, we started Articulate in 2013 with the idea that we wanted to provide a space for emerging artists to showcase their work online, but also be exhibited in dialogue with our audience. Um, so we built in the past um, two years a network of over 10,000 followers, um, artists from all over the world, um, with the idea of creating, of sh having a space online, but also um, 
having a space offline. So what we did is we organized around um, eight, eight exhibitions in the past two years. Um, we've built partnerships and collaborations with wonderful residency programs, institutions, um, brands. And uh, we also signed up over 150 artists from 50 countries, um, out of which we exhibited approximately 80. And, um, and um, what really emerged there was that there is quite a challenge within the current status quo of the art world. So just before I continue, how many artists are present tonight? Okay, well, quite a few. So you probably know that there's um, quite a few um, challenges to tackle, especially when it comes to um, funding. So we noticed that there is a bit big challenge. On the one hand, artists struggle with funding to produce their work and have to have um, part-time jobs and um, and find other ways to like um, sell and promote their work. And on the other hand, you have a whole new audience that is interested in contemporary art and wants to more actively participate in that dialogue, but doesn't quite know how to do that in a context of um, a traditional gallery model. So this is how we came up with the idea of um, our co-production and crowdfunding model. How it works is that artists can submit their work to our platform and create a profile. Um, we screen through their work and um, create like um, artist profiles for them. I will show you in a second on how that looks like. Each artist then has the possibility to um, basically crowdfund towards a finished work, set a target amount for a work that he created, and crowdfund that through our network. And so people that are um, interested in supporting the artist's practice can um, pledge towards an artwork and become co-owners of this work in return for a commission on sale once the artwork is sold. So it's kind of a new way of um, patronage, if you, if you wish. So on the one hand, people that want to support an artist and believe in an artist can support him financially, so artist gets funds up front to create new projects or works or uh, shows, and on the other hand, you create a whole new market dynamic where actually it's opening up to a wider art-interested audience that can participate in that funding process and really make um, a difference. So what we then do is we um, connect artists with their patrons, but also organize um, exhibitions with these funded works. So um, to give you a visual example, um, this is one of our photographers who we work with, fantastic photographer, by the way, you should look at his work. And uh, Nicolas, this is a typical um, artist profile on our platform. So you would have an artist statement if you wish to have an artist statement, quick facts, interviews if um, available, and then um, all of your artworks. Um, you can also acquire artworks directly online uh, through Articurate or at our um, exhibitions, and uh, you see all the descriptions and the editions, etc. Now, this is an example of um, one uh, of our um, crowdfunding campaigns. Um, so you would have the artwork, you would have a, a target campaign. It pretty much works like any other crowdfunding platform. Um, our campaigns are usually 45 days long. Um, and um, if uh, the target amount is reached, uh, the artist gets the fund straight, um, straight forward. Um, if the target amount is not reached, unfortunately, the funds um, are not transferred. And what happens then is basically how does an artist set the target amount? Um, the artist provides us uh, and sets the target amount by giving uh, the price of either uh, the production of the work um, the work that he has put in, the time that he has put in, anything minus any commission a gallerist would take, for example, and that is how he funds his work. So that is the funds that he would get up front in order like, to continue his practice. While when it goes for sale, there is a multiple of like 2.5 applied, which is then split 50-50 between the artists and, um, and the uh, patrons um, directly. Um, this is an example of a campaign that was successfully funded. Um, the crowdfunding model is only about 
two weeks old in public beta. Um, we had a private beta testing for about two months and we gathered a lot of feedback from both the artists and the patrons in order to really make sure that it runs smooth and it's clear. And since the public launch, we've already funded several works. Um, the artists are really um, thrilled and happy and we're getting very, very good um, feedback from the artistic community, but also from people that want to support artists. And um, here are just a few um, quotes by artists that um, were funded. So, I mean, I guess in a photography-specific context, um, it's quite important that with photographers, often works might not be physically produced yet, because maybe you're a photographer, you work with really large-scale works, it's very expensive um, to produce them. So, sometimes you have all these beautiful work, but it lives somewhere in your um, drive. And so um, this is a way that you can actually like produce your works. Um, while on the um, other hand, for patron, it's a great way to um, just feel more engaged within um, the, uh, with, with the artist and support the artist. If I find an artist that I want to support, that I have I've followed his practice or I've seen his work and I feel strongly about his work, I can even with a small dis like contribution make a huge difference to his like artistic practice and um, also uh, build a whole new like followership um, around it because I will want to tell my friends there is this artist that I feel strongly about and you should have a look at him or go to the exhibitions that we then actually physically organize. I mean, for us from the very beginning, it was very important to go beyond the, um, to go beyond just being like a arts platform that sells art online or that showcases and features art online, but really, create experiences around it. So we organize also talks and workshops and studio visits and these exhibitions where then people, um, artists and their audiences are brought together. And I think it's very important that artists can actually also learn who their um, respective audiences are. So um, to finish for those uh, artists amongst you who are here, um, what we provide and how we can help is pretty much like a, a tool for funding, but also a tool to showcase your work online, showcase your work offline, um, get direct feedback and connection with your patrons, um, uh, reach wider audiences, and basically be part of our network. And on the patron side, those amongst you who feel that they would like to um, learn more about emerging artists or support emerging artists' practices, um, even with a small contribution, you can make a big difference. So please do get in touch and I look forward to speaking to you later in a less nervous manner. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about something uh, slightly different than uh, I guess uh, the two uh, speakers that came before because it's going to be about art dealing and it's going to be about slightly more expensive work. But I think some of the things that um, we learned by looking at kind of the million dollar works that are being sold and also the thousand dollar works that are being sold also apply to, um, to the broader art market in general. And so it's interesting to, uh, to see. You know, to say that the art market is going great, right? I mean, this is the most expensive painting ever sold in the history of mankind three weeks ago um, for $179 million, a Picasso painting at Christie's. You all saw the image and uh, the PR that went around it. In fact, the art market is not going so well. And I, I actually, it's my conviction that there's a real revolution that's happening right now um, in the way people buy artwork that risks putting the traditional auction houses and also galleries out of business. And so I want to talk about uh, the revolution that's happening um, because I think it, it actually uh, will uh, also have an impact on everyone that's trying to, uh, to, to sell photography today and then talk about what we're doing about it, which is uh, the company that I run um, called Artlist. And so before that, I want to give you a bit of background. So uh, my name is Kenneth Schlenker, as Fabrice uh, mentioned, and I created a company three years ago in the art world, and it wasn't my background. And um, the reason I created this company is I loved contemporary art, but I didn't like the white wall gallery experience. And I wanted to create something different, which was warmer and, and where you can actually learn about contemporary artists. So I created a company called Gertrude, and the name is um, after you know, Gertrude Stein and, and her famous salon. And what Gertrude is, it's a network uh, for art events. And what we try to do is help people um, gather to learn, discuss, and potentially collect the work of contemporary artists. And we had curators that organized those events that we call salons um, all over the world. And actually, 
in uh, analyzing the problem and and and, um, and 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 the motivations behind creating this, I actually you know feel a lot uh, similarly to what Nero just mentioned for RDQ8. So there's a real need for better ways to experience contemporary art. And what we did is we actually grew this network um, across the world uh, to 25,000 uh, members and hosted more than 250 events in the past three years in seven cities across the world. Uh, and these events are independently organized by people who actually are experts in specific fields, um, find a location, uh, find an artist, and uh, talk about the works. And it's usually less than 40 people. It's very intimate. It lasts for one hour. Um, and there's usually uh, the work of one artist that's presented. So you can actually uh, get to learn about the works. And these events happen in collectors' homes. Um, they happen in, in artist studios. They sometimes happen in, in, in uh, random places like uh, hotel rooms um, or uh, living rooms. And uh, it's always those three rules, 40 people, uh, one hour, and the work of, of one artist presented by an expert. So this is essentially the, the background um, that got us interested in, in creating Artlist. And the reason is, as we're building this community and as we created this network of collectors, we found out that there was something else happening, uh, which wasn't so much about the event, was really about the way people purchased art. And the, what's happening is, you know, traditionally in the, in the art world, you have kind of the collectors on one hand, the artists on the other. In the middle, you have intermediaries. You have you know, the auction houses, you have the, um, you have the galleries, you have uh, people who say what you should look at, what you should buy, at what price, et cetera. And it's been like this for, for, for hundreds of years. And the thing that we were seeing is, and this is just a, another article that we got about, um, about Gertrude, and the, the, the thing that we're, we're seeing is that um, collectors wanted to go beyond that and wanted to actually discuss by themselves outside of the big intermediaries and uh, start dealing artwork uh, outside of, of, of those intermediaries. And that's what we're seeing uh, right now, which is why you know, and I call uh, the revolution. And the, the key to that revolution, I think, is this, is that today, uh, buyers feel confident, so collectors feel confident making purchase decisions for thousands of dollars, sometimes dozens of thousands of dollars, sometimes hundreds of thousands of dollars, or even millions of dollars, based on a, a JPEG, a digital image, not with, without necessarily having to, to, to see the work in person. And that's completely transforming. Uh, the market. So, you know, if you go and speak to a gallery in Chelsea today and you start about talking about collecting your work, what's going to happen is you're going to start receiving these emails, uh, which are previews with an attachment, a PDF, where you're going to see <clears throat> all the works they have for sale. <clears throat> and you're actually supposed to make a decision based on, uh, on, on, on those PDFs. And in fact, you know, this, is, this is an example for Freeze Art Fair. So for any art fair, you're going to get millions of emails that are being sent to collectors before the art fair happens, and collectors are going to review these images, and they're going to make their decisions based on uh, these images. So the way actually a typical art sale happens today um, involves both online and a little bit of offline. So it's not like everything is moving online or everything is staying offline. It's kind of half and half. So typically people discover an artwork the f for the first time via JPEG online. So it could be an email that somebody sends to someone. It could be on Instagram. It could be uh, on Articurate or, or on other online platforms. And um, then what they will do is they'll most likely go and see it in person in a gallery or where it's shown. They will learn about it. And learning about it today happens a lot online. Uh, it happens through sharing links, reading about articles bios, ch you know, checking about the price of the market. This is all available online. Uh, then they'll maybe negotiate the price. That happens again online, uh, or maybe by phone, phone, but mostly by uh, email. Then they'll actually purchase the work. That again happens online. And then they'll deal with transportation, everything that goes happen, and that mostly, again, happens online. And so, in fact, it's not so much that, um, you know, when is the art world going to go online? Uh, the art world has already gone online, um, and there's only a small portion of it which is remaining offline. And, and that, I think, is very important when you look at you know, the market in general, because all the businesses that were built around uh, the art market are built around physical spaces, you know, the galleries, the auction houses with their exhibition um, rooms. And so that's really uh, fundamentally um, being questioned right now. Another thing that's interesting that when looking at the art market is the way the other intermediaries are being disintermediated. That's something that happens a lot um, when the market goes online. Um, so, you know, there used to be like critics that are very, very important um, and magazines that really told people which artists they should look at, which shows they should visit, what they should do, what they should buy. 
Um, and now there's more and more uh, individuals that are actually taking that on. And if you look at something like Instagram, and I know you had a session about Instagram uh, a while ago, this is really where it's happening. So, you know, you get Art Forum is this traditional kind of magazine that, that's existed forever that, you know, told you um, which exhibitions were happening in a season at every, at every gallery and what you should be looking at and critics were, were telling you uh, what to look at. And now you get people like, uh, you know, Perry Dust, who's an um, Instagram a user that has more than 200,000 followers. I think it's 250 now, thousand. Um, and who's actually, I think the, the account is like 18 months old. And now her influence is actually much greater than a magazine like, um, uh, like Art Forum in, in deciding, in, in people having to decide, you know, wh which exhibition they should look at, which artist they should consider. So she takes pictures of actually mostly herself um, and with, uh, you know, high fashion accessories and it's styled in front of artwork. And that's extremely popular. And now a lot of people make their decisions on, you know, which show they should be looking at and which artists they should be looking at based on uh, uh, accounts like hers. And galleries are fighting for her to come to, her, to, to their shows because it's a huge influence and it actually drives a lot of traffic and drives a lot of sales. So it's really this intermediation. Um, you know, in a different way, this is, um, this is an account by an artist that I really like. Uh, it's called uh, Brad Trommel. It's a young artist based in, in New York. And you know, the galleries usually had the role of trying to explain to their collectors what their artists were doing uh, and educate them and really act as an intermediary again. And increasingly what you're seeing is that artists are doing that themselves. And so on Instagram, you get people like Brad Trommel that are taking pictures of their process, explaining how they're experimenting with things, uh, their trials and errors, getting comments and feedback from people. Um, so again, disintermediation and uh, artists kind of playing that role. And this is just another example of uh, this purely online publication that was created um, that has a, a huge impact and uh, in a very short amount of time and, that, and that's uh, uh, being very important in, in, in people's making decisions on what they should be looking at. Um, and then when it comes to art dealing, of course, you know, the same happens. So it used to be that you had to have your kind of gallery space in Chelsea, on 24th Street, beautiful, uh, you know, beautiful space to attract people, have the credibility and potentially sell work. And now you get people, um, they're doing this actually on Instagram. So in this case, this is a former auctioneer that already had a lot, you know, very respectable brand before doing this. But now, you know, he has more than 113,000 followers and including most of the influential people in the art world. And when he posts a picture of an artist or an artwork on Instagram, it has an instant effect on the markets. People start buying their, the work, people start being interested, museums start being interested in, in, in the artist, so it's happening much faster and it's it, you know, without any major intermediary. Um, and in contrast to it, what we've just seen, which is kind of this um, very fast revolution that's happening, uh, the, 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 the reality of the, of the market is still very much like it was uh, 250 years ago. So, you know, if you look at the secondary art market, so secondary art market is when you own a piece of art and you're trying to resell it, as opposed to primary, which is when you're purchasing firsthand from an artist or from uh, the gallery. So secondary market, you know, is dominated by two very, very large companies. They're Christie's and Sotheby's, they're auction houses on a traditional business model. And they, they basically have uh, more than 60% of the market. So, you know, to, to, to say the least, like this is going to change and this is going to change very, very rapidly. Um, and I think it impacts everyone. They're, you know, artists, they're, they're very established and also um, people that are emerging and they're trying to, to, uh, to build, a, um, to become artists and, and, to, uh, and to make a living out of it. And so I'm going to talk about like more specifically what we're doing on the secondary markets um, to address this. And so I built a company called Artlist. And <clears throat> What Artlist is, is uh, it's, a, it's an online marketplace uh, for private sales. So essentially, it's an alternative to the traditional auction houses. And the, the question we asked you know, was, if we were to reinvent the auction house today, what would it look at, like? And our answer was uh, Artlist. And so you know, the, the way our mission with Artlist is really to, to transform the markets and to make it 
much faster, to make it much uh, more secure, and also uh, much more fair, and I'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, we take a flat 10% uh, commission on any works that are sold on the platform. So again, it's secondary markets, so it's people reselling, but we take a 10% commission. And we actually split that commission in half, uh, and give half of that commission back to the artists who originally created the work, um, which is something that uh, auction houses don't do, and, and, and uh, um, mostly, it doesn't, doesn't happen, um, except for a, a few countries where it's actually legally, um, we have to do it. Uh, so, you know, just to give you like, a few examples that are um, relevant to this audience, so we have mostly, we have a lot of paintings and sculptures and, and different kinds of works, but we also have photography, uh, you know, including um, like, a, like this, for instance, very, very famous painting that only exists in, uh, in an edition of three, there was five originally, and actually two were destroyed in the process. And actually, this one is, is for instance, for sale on our platform. We also had, you know, photographies like uh, like like Warhol Polaroids in the past available for sale. But let me show you how it works. Basically, what Artist is is it's a it's a website that you can um, that you can see from a desktop or from a mobile phone that has uh, artworks that are available, um, you know, for sale and listed by collectors from all over the world. And there's two types of artworks. There private artworks and public artworks. So public artworks are artworks where you see the artist's name, the, the, the title, you get to see the images, zoom in into the image, you can see every, every detail of it, the condition, um, you'll get to see the provenance, and you'll be able to purchase the work up front at the listing price or make an offer for a lower price, and we'll deliver the work. Uh, and then there are private artworks for which the seller wants to know you before showing you the work, that's for more expensive, more complicated work. And you can request access, and the seller will have 72 hours to decide to show you the image. And when they do, uh, based on your profile, and when they do, you'll, you'll see the image and it'll be watermarked with your name. So the privacy nature of that market is extremely important. We'll come back to that. Uh, and so when you see the image, then you're able to purchase the work at the listing price, so also make an offer. You're also able to chat uh, anonymously and, and, and confidentially with the seller. Um, so you can make offers, you can ask for complimentary information about about the artist, about like shows that they're doing, about um, about anything you want, and then we can actually uh, we'll secure payments up to uh, one million dollars. So this is basically how it works, um, and I think you know what's interesting. So we, we've been live actually for uh, almost a year, and actually it was private for, for uh, the first um, the first few months. And, uh, and it's been publicly available for the past four months. So, I mean, there's a few things that I think could be interesting to talk about. I think I have to go back to the right slide. Uh, when it comes to, you know, new business models in photography and how we can, you know, basically learn things from the experience of, of artists. The first thing is we, I think, believe that um, high value in terms of price art uh, can be listed and, and sold online. Um, and that's something that not, you know, didn't exist a couple of years ago. Um, and, and I think the key thing here is if privacy is respected. So I think the people that are spending a few thousand dollars up to a million dollars on a piece of art really require a certain amount of privacy and also sellers, like whether they are artists or, or people on the secondary market. They don't necessarily want, for instance, to give you an example, you don't want if it's a unique or like you have a, a photography of edition of six and you know you don't necessarily want it to be up on the website available for sale and nothing sells for three years. It's not necessarily great. Uh, and so you have to find a way online to uh, prevent that from happening and that's what we do uh, with Artlist. I think the second thing that's interesting and that we found a lot is that Instagram is a great way uh, to to, you know, can, can lead to sales. Uh, and we see that on Artlist actually every day where people first see an image on Instagram um, and then get in touch with us and actually ultimately it leads to sales. So it's really a place where a lot of people, um, especially collectors, um, are and try to find, you know, look out for new things all the time. And, you know, it's very visual, it's very fast. It's very mobile, and so people um, find things and then, and then they're able to make decisions. I think you know, another element that we kind of learned with Artlist, which is interesting, is the, is the fact that um, uh, you, you can, you know, speaking directly between buyers and sellers, 
um, can work. So you know, traditionally, like there's always a gallerist in the middle. There's always um, there's always someone facilitating that discussion, and I think we've been able to prove that that that's not always the case. Um, but I think the, the personal element is always very important when you're speaking about like you know acquiring a, a piece of art. It's going to be online, so yes, it's slightly impersonal, but the, the personal element is always uh, super important. So we end up actually spending a lot of time on the phone with people um, and helping uh, and helping facilitate uh, facilitate the, the the sale in that way. And I think you know another interesting element is like if you're going to go for you know, if, if we're going to go for a world where there's uh, no intermediaries or very little intermediary and, and you're an artist and you want to create your own market and, and go out there, uh, you're not going to be able to rely on the brand of um, the gallery or the person that, 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 that's representing you. So um, you need to develop your own brand. And that's something that uh, we've been able to learn uh, as well. And thank you so much. And uh, yeah. I think I'm way over time.